Good morning, church. Um, that beautiful sunlight you see streaming in behind me is uh, the glorious morning we're having here. On Sunday morning, the fourth Sunday of Easter in Crossville, Tennessee. I hope things are going well for you way over there as well. We miss you guys. Uh, we can't wait to see you again. We are dedicated to keeping one another and our neighbors uh, reasonably safe, though. And so we keep praying for the healing of our communities and our land. And we keep longing and anticipating the day that we can see each other's smiling faces. It's going to be nice, by the way, to do this live and not have to talk into a camera. Um, <clears throat> I like looking at your faces a lot better than I like looking at mine. So let's talk this morning for just a few minutes about uh, the notion of virtue. Um, this has been something that's weighed on my mind for quite some time these uh, last few months. And to talk about virtue, what I want to do is I want to begin with a reading from Galatians chapter 5. And it's a good springtime reading because it's about gardening. And Michelle and I spent most of our day yesterday doing yard work. We would have liked to put out a garden. We just didn't get it done in time. We might do a fall garden later this year. But this Galatians text is a gardening text. And so let's start in Galatians 5, starting in verse 16. This is Paul giving instruction to the Galatians. He says, I say, be guided by the Spirit, and you won't carry your selfish carry out rather your selfish desires. A person's selfish desires are set against the Spirit, and the Spirit is set against one's selfish desires. They are opposed to each other. So you shouldn't do whatever you want to do. But if you are being led by the Spirit, you aren't under the law. The actions that are produced by selfish motives are obvious, since they include sexual immorality and moral corruption and doing whatever feels good and idolatry or drug use and casting spells or hate or fighting or obsession or losing your temper or competitive opposition Conflict or selfishness or group rivalry, jealousy, drunkenness, partying, and other things like that. I warn you, as I have already warned you, that those who do these kinds of things won't inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against things like this. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified self with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit. Let's not become arrogant, make each other angry, or be jealous of each other. And so virtue. Um, virtue is a term that's not often used in the New Testament. It doesn't show up an awful lot, but when you start to understand what the concept is, you begin to understand that it's um, everywhere around the New Testament. It's a fairly important concept because virtue doesn't deal with so much just what you do. It's not just about ticking boxes. It's not just about uh, accomplishing a checklist. It's not about saying, oh, well, I went to church on Sunday. I sang all of the songs. I turned in my Bible with every scripture reference. I bowed my head for every prayer. I took the Lord's Supper. I didn't cuss. I haven't kicked my dog. I paid my taxes. I didn't watch movies that I shouldn't watch. It's not just about following rules, but virtue is about who you are. It's about character. And really, when it comes down to it, what I want to think about this morning is that this list that Paul gives, starting in verse 22 of Galatians 5 that we just read, it, it is a list of virtues. It isn't so much about what you think or just what you do, even though it includes both of those things, but it's about who you are. Talking about virtue is a way of saying that Jesus is not so much after just what's in our noggin, or he's not just so much after whatever we can um, think to do in a ritual or a rote way. He's not just after our actions divorced from heart or intent or belief, but he is after who we are. He's after all of us. And so the virtues classically are these rhythms of life or these 
matters of habit that lead us into a life of, of flourishing, a life of, in the context of the New Testament, a life that reflects the goodness of God's kingdom. And so to talk about virtue is to talk about what sort of person we are when uh, we are what God is trying to make us to be. And so in 2 Peter chapter 3, a text we talked about a few weeks ago, you remember there Paul, or Peter rather, is talking to a group of Christians who are facing opposition from outside of the church and inside of the church, and there's this heavy temptation to give up. And, and he reminds them of the end of the story. And in verse 13 of 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, What we're waiting for is the coming of God's promises, new heavens and new earth where, and he uses this phrase, righteousness is at home where the way things ought to be fits in. That's just the way things are. And Peter's question in the midst of all of that is, since we know where this is going, since we know what the story is headed towards, since we know that at the end we're going to have these new heavens and new earth where righteousness is at home, what sort of person, what sort of people ought we be? What does it look like to become a person that would fit in in a place where righteousness is at home. This is virtue language. Not just what you believe, not just what you do, because we can fake that a lot of the time, but who you are. What does the rhythm of your life, the in and out motions of your life, tell us about who we are and where we're going? Do the rhythms of our life lead us to thriving, and we would call those virtues? Or do the rhythms of our life lead us to chaos and disorder and destruction? We would call those vices. And I say rhythms and I say routines and I say habits because that's really where we get down to seeing who we are. Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples. Um, one of the things that I have struggled with across my life uh, sometimes in the past more so than now is getting angry at people on the road. I don't know if any of you can relate to this and I say more so in the past now because I haven't really driven in two months. Um, I drive a five speed. I've almost forgotten how to drive it since uh, March. But I have all of my life heard sermons about not being angry, about loving our neighbors, about not doing the sorts of things that well up inside of me on the road when somebody cuts me off or, or they don't signal or they won't let me over, or they run a red light or they do some insane thing. Now, never mind that I also occasionally do those things, not on purpose and, and with great regret when I do them, but when someone cuts me off or any of those things, I want to yell at them. I want to raise my fist at them. I want to honk my horn at them. I want to think less than pleasant things about them. And I've heard sermons and, and teachings, I've preached sermons and teachings all of my life against those sorts of things. Up here in my head, I know all of the reasons why I shouldn't do those sorts of things when somebody violates one of the rules of the road in my presence. Or maybe they don't violate one of the rules of the road, maybe they just go too slow. I know all of the reasons why I shouldn't get angry. But it's also the case that oftentimes what happens is somebody cuts you off or somebody's going too slow or you're in a hurry and they won't let you over. And before you even realize what you're doing, before your brain even kicks into gear to say, hey, you should probably love this person. Before your brain kicks into gear and says, hey, you should probably show grace to this person because you've been in their shoes too. Before any of that happens, the rhythm, the routine, the reflex, the habit that is in, ingrained into me is to lash out in anger, to think ill thoughts, to raise a fist, to have to, or to honk the horn, got to pull back from that, to yell at them. And so for all of the things that I know for all of the things that I believe, for all of the things that I think are right and true and good, there are those times where that old ingrained rhythm or routine or habit, it kicks in before I even know what's going on. Well, virtue is about uh, dealing with those rhythms and routines and habits. And just by the way, do you, you realize, and you, of course you realize, that most of the things we do in our life are actually parts of rhythms and routines and habits. 
uh, stick with the driving metaphor for just a minute. You remember when you first learned to drive and how tenuous and tedious that was, and there was a step-by-step process, and, and I, I'm living at the house that I grew up in when I learned to drive. And I remember the first thing Dad did is he took me right out here in the driveway, and the car was parked on the carport, and he says, okay, now I'm going to teach you how to back the car up, and we backed it to the end of the driveway, and then we drove it forward, and then we backed it back. Before he ever let me on the road, I was really good at backing and pulling forward in the driveway. But I remember that it was a very regimented step-by-step process that I had to give a lot of thought to uh, you put your hands here and here. You make sure the radio's off. You check this mirror and this mirror and this mirror. You make sure your foot's on the right pedal. You make sure the gear shift's in the right place. And you go through all of these steps, and it was very much a, an intentional do this, now do this, now do this sort of thing that I had to explicitly think about. But now, if I'm not careful, I can drive all the way to the store, all the way back from the store and and not even really think about at all what I'm doing as far as the driving part goes. It's second nature. And most of what we do in our life is second nature. If we are going to find joy in something, as a joyous person, we we do that by second nature most of the time. We, We see it as a matter of reflex and a matter of habit. If we are going to be thankful for something, that thankfulness becomes a habit. If we are going to be gracious towards someone most of the time in our life, that graciousness has become an ingrained habit in our life, a knee-jerk reaction. If, on the other hand, we are going to condemn or we are going to complain or we are going to see the glasses half empty instead of half full, those things are knee-jerk reactions that have developed over time. And so, um, the fruit of the Spirit that Paul gives us here, these are virtues because they are the sorts of rhythms and the sorts of routines and the sorts of habits that we develop in partnership with the Spirit, by the prompting of the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit. The Spirit is the primary operator here, but we work in conjunction with the Spirit to form the sort of life, to become the sort of people that thrives. And so we are the people who, and this is kind of my challenge this week, we become the sort of people who set out to intentionally form that second nature reflex to love someone, to lay down our agenda, to lay down our power to put someone else first. We become the sort of people who set out to develop that reflex to be joyous, to choose to celebrate, to choose to see good, to choose to do um, gratitude and gratefulness until those things become second nature. Over on my school project page, Southern Fried Theology, one of the things we do every morning in our morning prayer is that we We begin with thankfulness. We have a period of silence where we just kind of settle in, and then we practice thankfulness. We sit down, we take a minute to find something in the last day, maybe a big thing, maybe a small thing that we have been thankful for for the last day, and we spend about a minute turning that around in our mind, relishing that, enjoying that, so that we can give it to God. And what happens is, over time, as you take those intentional steps, just like learning to drive, step one, step two, step three, step four, As you intentionally and meaningfully do that, it becomes second nature. We want to be the sort of people who are joyous and gracious and loving and patient and kind and and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled. We want to be the sort of people who do that by second nature reflex. And so we find ways to practice doing those things intentionally. And I say this is a good springtime text because it's a a gardening text. And that's what the fruit of the Spirit is about. There's that old phrase, what you sow is what you reap. And if we are engaging with intentionality and regularity and in partnership with the Spirit, the disciplines of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, those are the fruit that we're going to reap. And so this week, ask yourself, 
what does the fruit in your life say about who you are? What does the fruit in your life demonstrate about the sort of person you've become? And there's a very real sense that if you're not demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit in your life, if the virtues are not in your life, if your routines and habits do not lead you to the sort of life that Jesus would consider the good life, then it really doesn't matter what you believe. And it really doesn't matter what sort of ritual or rote things that you can do because we've missed out on who we are. And so where can I find opportunity to practice love? Because I want love to become a knee-jerk reaction. Where can I practice or find opportunity to practice joy in partnership with the Spirit? Because I want joyousness to be a knee-jerk reaction. Where can I find the opportunity to be a person of peace? And um, I don't know if you've noticed, there are plenty of opportunities around right now to be a person of peace. Uh, because we're in a world that's not really keen on that at the moment. But these virtues, these habits, these rhythms, these routines of life, where can we find opportunity to develop those? And I've thought about this for a long time. And by the way, I haven't talked about this for a long time. But this is one of the big things that runs just underneath the surface of my ministry with you is to see us formed into not just a people who believe the right things or do the right things on Sunday, but who are the right kind of people, who are good and virtuous people, who when push comes to shove, they side by rhythm and reflex, by second nature, by virtue with who Jesus is. And so church, go out this week and practice prayerfully engage in life with the Spirit by your side, the Spirit driving you, the Spirit forming you. Go out this week and do a little gardening. Develop those rhythms of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. It won't happen overnight, just like your plants in your garden don't grow overnight. But go out and do that gardening in anticipation of God giving the increase that God longs to give and God yearns to give and God has promised to give. Uh, that's what we're here for. And so um, now let's pray. I want to pray for you and then you can pray with me and we'll go from there. Father, we ask that you would form our hearts and our minds and our lives so that we could be your people. God, help us not just to do loving things, but to make us loving people, not just to do joyous things, but to be a joyous people, a peaceful people, a patient people, a people that demonstrates the presence and the work of your spirit in our lives. Father, I pray that we would reflect your light from the most inner parts of ourselves into the world around us, that you would form us and you would shape us into a people who are like Jesus. And now we come together and we pray as a family. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second one is like it, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two depend all the law and the prophets. We love because God first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God and hates a brother or sister, he is a liar. Because the person who doesn't love a brother or sister who can be seen, can't love God who can't be seen. This commandment we have from him those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also.
Church, have a great week. We love you. We miss you. We can't wait to see you again. But go be God's people this week. Thanks.